In the previous video, I discussed how much movies cost, and broke down the production and often neglected marketing and distribution budgets. Some of you, like myself, didn't realize just how much was spent or kept and by who. Since 50% of the box office is kept by theaters, I figured, let's tackle how theaters generate revenue. And don't worry, there are plenty more discussions to get into at later times, and if you have something else you want me to look into, comment below and I'll add it to the list. And let me emphasize, this video is going to focus on revenue, not profit and the chart at the end will be a breakdown of all the numbers that I get into with revenue and expenses of theaters. My goal is to merely give a ballpark of these numbers, because this got way more complex than I thought it was going to be for the subject in my time frame. So, if you don't know, simply put, revenue is money generated by business operations like making a sale, while profit is the financial gain after all expenses have been subtracted from the revenue. Alright, now let's get into it. Theaters have three primary forms of revenue. Admissions, or ticket sales, concessions, the food and beverage, and advertising, which are ads and trailers. The first one I want to go over is the one people think is the primary source of revenue, concessions. Simply put, concessions are not the primary source of revenue for theaters. This may have been true years ago when the film landscape was a different beast, but not today. Theaters most often must work out brand deals to acquire the food and drink they sell. All the Nestle, Hershey, Frito-Lay, and other such products require a brand deal, no different than any store or gas station to sell said product. In order to cover costs like storage and transportation, the profit margin is set fairly high. This is why a small popcorn costs $8 and your left testicle for something that realistically costs about a dollar. This is actually something of goodwill on the part of theaters, because the profit margin of popcorn is so high they can offer a refill because the hit is so low. But make no mistake, the refill isn't actually free. Well, if the profit margins are so high, then how are concessions not the primary source of revenue? Check this out. Nine out of ten theaters do not own the equipment you see. They rent it. Yep, popcorn makers, slushy machines, nacho warmers, nacho cheese heaters, pretzel rotisseries, all of it is most likely rented from companies that provide those machines. There are two main reasons for this, cost and responsibility. It is way cheaper to rent a machine than it is to own it, even at the scale of larger theater chains, because then you don't have to hire extra workers dedicated to fixing the machines and all that entails. It's a sad fact of reality a few reliable handymen are a wee bit more expensive than the legions of expendable high schoolers that can't do anything but pick their noses and watch TikTok. This is where the responsibility comes in, as the extra costs of handymen is shifted to the equipment rental companies who can replace the machine with another one that works immediately, or get it fixed without theaters having to stop operations to get their machine repaired. Now, if only McDonald's can keep their ice cream machines working, that'd be great. Now, as I mentioned, advertising is the third form of revenue, though in a little bit you'll understand my frustration with it. Both the ads and trailers that play before a film cost money to put on screen, and ads are simpler, so let's start there. According to websites Dash 2 and Blue Line Cinema, there are different ad campaigns you can purchase, being 15, 30, and 60 seconds. These are the general ads that you see, like motion ads, trivia, and commercials. Ranging from one to four grand, depending on the ad length, they run at least one month average, but theaters often require a minimum five grand be spent to get ads on their screens. Now, unfortunately, I cannot find anything definitive on movie trailers. I mean, I couldn't find anything like the White House security couldn't find who left the bag of coke in the bathroom. The only ones I could think of who would know would be the tax accountants, and with the time frame I work in, I just couldn't find anything on this, so I'm sorry. So there you have the three forms of theatrical revenue, but these are just the revenue. What about the expenses? It costs money to make money, so what must revenue cover? We've already covered film distribution and brand deals needing to be organized individually with the respective parent companies, studios, and distributors, so what else? Well, utilities, of course. Gotta pay the water, electric, and garbage unless you want Oscar the Grouch to move in and start slinging dope in the back alley. And of course, all those nose-picking teenage TikTokers need to be paid for some reason, so salaries have to be covered as well as the the extortion that is taxes. That's fine and dandy, but is there anything to ground these values? Thank you for the question, voice in my head that's a sign of early onset dementia. Yes, in fact, in my research I came across AMC Theaters, who've been gracious and post their 10k documents 
to their website. You can download this yourself if you wish to view them, but don't worry, I'm going to summarize the information for you. For those who don't know, a Form 10-K is an annual report that must be filed by publicly traded companies with the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. It discloses the results of business operations for the year it is filed. What you see here is a screenshot of the public data that has been simplified on the website from the Form 10-Ks for years 2019 through 2022. Now, real quick, I will not discuss the data below these four expenses. The fact that I understand any of this is already taxing on all one of my brain cells. Also, this is consolidated, so these numbers are domestic and foreign combined. All right. Let's focus on the first column. In the first row is ticket sales, followed by concessions. I haven't found anything definitive yet, but I'm confident other theater in the third row means revenue from other theaters that are owned by AMC. And of course, lastly, is the grand total of revenues for each year. And these numbers are measured in millions, so the four-digit totals at the bottom are actually billions. This means 2019, the year of Avengers Endgame, resulted in 5.47 billion in revenue, and so on with each year. And yes, advertising is not here, so I don't know if it simply wasn't reported or it falls under something else. All my research says it exists, but until I find it, I can't confirm anything just yet. Now, let's cover the four basic expenses. The first row shows film exhibition, which is distribution. Food and beverage is the cost of concessions, followed by operating expenses, and of course, rent. Don't worry about the depreciation and amortization, because that's a whole nother can of worms to get into with write-offs and whatnot. So, as you can see, the cost of film distribution is gnarly at 1.7 billion, fitting almost perfectly into that 50% range of admissions we discussed before. So, that's covered. Then we've got food and beverage at 279 million, but right underneath this, at 1.7 billion, are all of the operating expenses. This is salaries, utilities, equipment, and the like. So now you see what concessions basically cover. Lastly is rent, and I'm pretty sure this is solely the property itself, but I could be wrong on that. Again, not a financial guy. And for a kicker, here are the totals of just these four expenses with the differences underneath those. As you can see, 2019 is like most men trying to seal the deal, a little inflated. 2019 was a record year for theaters, but then we have the not-so-friendly years with the coup and forced shutdown of the world, and we see it took almost three years before theaters started to make anything back. Again, these numbers are not fully explained, as there are many more to discuss. I wanted to keep this simple, and I only have so much time in the week. Nonetheless, these four years are examples of an extraordinary year, devastating year, a year of recovery, and one of relative normality. And I hope this was educational, and if you want me to keep diving deeper into more financial specifics like this, then comment below and I'll add it to the list. Otherwise, I will be bouncing between these videos, more discussions, and the occasional review, as I think this is the way to move forward with things right now. So until then, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.